I'm a sucker for a good love story. There's nothing I enjoy more than sitting next to a couple at a dinner party and reaching the moment in the evening where I get to ask, so how did you two meet? The couple share a look at each other as if to say, are you going to tell our story or should I? There is always that one person who says, you tell it. I like how you tell it. This person will also inevitably be the one who ends up interrupting the entire time because their partner is, and I quote, leaving out the most important parts. (laughs) It's a storytelling two-step that transports them back to the inciting incident that changed the course of their lives forever. Their meet cute. Every good love story has a great meet cute. For those who are not romantic comedy aficionados like myself and wondering what is a meet cute, a meet cute by definition is a charming first encounter between two characters that leads to the development of a romantic relationship. Some happen in college dorm halls, many in loud bars, others in airplanes, airports, weddings, funerals. I mean, I'm sure that's happened. Grocery stores, barbecues, fighting over taxi cabs, elevators at work, or maybe because they happened to both show up alone to a mutual friend's dinner party to find themselves sat next to one another. That first spark, skip of a heartbeat, flap of a butterfly's wings in your belly is what all of the best movies and love songs are written about. When everything finally just makes sense, like it was all meant to be. But is it? Is the meat cute on purpose because of the stars and the moon and this idea that we all have one person in the world who is the counterpart to ourselves? Or is meeting the one completely left up to chance? Is meeting your person because of the small choices you make on a day-to-day basis that just happen to put you in the right place at the right time with some person you happen to really like? Or are we all meant to cross paths with the person we're meant to be with, regardless of if we left our apartment five minutes early that day, or decided to walk instead of jump in a cab, or take the job across the country, miss our flight, or stay back for that one last drink instead of heading home early. My guest today had the ultimate meet cute on our TV screens with millions of people watching. I was, yep, I was watching. I was one of the millions. I remember first meeting Rachel Lindsay back in 2016 as an attorney from Austin looking for love on The Bachelor. And while Nick Vile was not her meant to be, Rachel Lindsay was meant to be the first African-American lead in The Bachelor franchise's history of ABC's 13th season of The Bachelorette, where she'd go on to capture not only our hearts, but the heart of Brian Abisolo, whom she is still with today and officially married in 2019. Now Rachel has written her first novel, Real Love, a novel about the chances we take or don't take when it comes to finding love, all while navigating the nagging what-ifs in between. And it just so happens to take place on a national beloved reality dating show. Something that Rachel Lindsay definitely knows a little bit about. You can also catch Rachel Lindsay as the co-host on The Ringer's Higher Learning with Van Lathan, hosting the Morally Corrupt podcast, and as a correspondent for Extra TV. Her collection of essays, Miss Me With That, Hot Takes, Helpful Tidbits, and A Few Hard Truths, is available everywhere you buy or download books, as is her debut novel, Real Love. Please enjoy as I fangirl all over Rachel Lindsay. Um, I mean, what yes. a world that we live in in content yes. creating these days, which I am sure you know you okay. very, very well. Um, I want to jump right in to an interview that you've had that has been become like pretty infamous. And I just like I don't want to beat her on the bush because how amazing was it for the entire <laughs> cast of um, the Locust uh, Hotel? Like the, the 
uh, the locusts. I had this whole setup and now I'm all like <laughs> white lotus. I'm caught up on my raid conversation I just had with you. Like, woo. I live in Tennessee. I'm like the locusts. You know, we've got a tornado <laughs> warning out here. I'm up in an attic. That's okay. I'm all over the place. Okay. Um, my delivery was awful, but I love this video of you so much with just surrounded by a, like a bunch of the member cast members of White Lotus just fangirling over you. And it is so <laughs> wonderful. And I'm fangirling over you, which is why I'm tripping all over my words. But how fun is that? to, you know, all these seasons and years later um, from being The Bachelorette and still having people on red carpets who you're interviewing, just basically wanting to interview you. It's so much fun. And it's so surreal at the same time. Because, <laughs> Sorry, my dog's in the back. Um, <laughs> um, but it's really surreal because I just, I'm there to do a job. And so I'm seeing myself as Rachel, the reporter, and not Rachel as the Bachelorette, but that's how they see me. And then, you know, like, I know I'm a fan of reality TV, but I don't expect other people to be a fan. So when they're like, wait, we watch you and you were on this season and you did this, I'm like, whoa, stars, they're just like us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. And I do love that, like, that no one beats around the bush about, uh, about reality TV, like their love for re reality TV anymore. It is no longer a guilty pleasure. It is just in a world where we all just need all the pleasure, pleasure that we can get. Everyone mm -hmm. is uh, very forthcoming about their love for reality TV. What Which shows yes. do you watch? Oh my gosh. I'm a Bravo-holic. Mm -hmm. Whenever I do watch What Happens Live, Andy's like, nothing media personality, attorney, off, none of that. He goes, super fan. Bravo, <laughs> super fan. Rachel Lindsay. And I'm like, that's me. Yeah. I watch pretty much every Bravo show except for Below Deck. I know, which is so taboo because so many people watch it. Um, and I just got into Love is Blind. I never watched and I just watched this last Same. season. And I've seen the whole thing already. I don't think the whole thing's out, but I had to you do You saw all of season four? I've seen all of season four. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I am on I the get edge it now. of my seat. I know. <laughs> I get it. I'm like, oh, this is what people have been talking about. So I'm crazy enough. I'm not really into love reality shows, maybe because of my own experience. Why? But love yeah, that's is so blind. crazy. <laughs> I think I know too much. Yeah. I don't know. But I do, I do love Love is Blind. I enjoyed it this season. I watched the season three of Love is Blind and was like, this is re like I start. I feel like the journey you go on with your own personal monologue in your brain while watching it is hilarious. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is so dumb. Like, everyone's just performing. There's no way these people are going to like each other. And then you're like, oh, my God, no, they really like each other. Oh, my God, they love each other. Oh, no, they don't. This is a real, like, complicated relationship. And then you're like, they're going to run off into the sunset. And I believe in <laughs> love again. <laughs> it's so true. But like Love is Blind has such a good it's there's a lot more reality to it than there is yeah. in like The Bachelor. So it makes sense to me. I expect these couples to stand the test of time. That's what I expect. So we'll see. Because you, they go back to their hometown, you, they get their cell phones back, they get to meet their friends, not just family members in these like staged very, we're like in a scenario where there's food, but no one's actually eating. Like that's my biggest mm -hmm. pet peeve is when there is a meal and no one's eating. I'm like, no, no. Imagine how hard it is sitting in front of that food and not being no. able to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, were you a fan of reality TV? I want to take it back to the beginning because this is the Super Bloom podcast after all. So <laughs> we're going to go into your personal Super Bloom, which is just bloom in these days. Um, but were you a fan of reality TV back when you were a practicing lawyer, you're 31 years old, you have two colleagues that pop their head in, you just gone through a breakup and they pop their head into your office and are like, hey, Rachel, you should try out for this show. Like, were, how were you watching a lot of reality TV? Did you know about the Bachelor, Bachelorette franchise? I, yes, I was watching a lot of reality TV. I was deep into my housewives phase mm -hmm. and I was original. I, I guess my first peek into reality TV was a real world. I don't remember which city, but I wasn't a faithful real world watcher. And then I 
got into like Flavor of Love and I oh, Love yes. New York. So those were love reality shows that I watched, loved those. And I'm sure I'm forgetting about a couple of few of the beginning ones, but Housewives, I was definitely deep into at the time, but I was not a Bachelor fan. I had been to Bachelor watch parties, maybe like two, but I didn't pay attention to what was on the screen. I was just there to socialize and have some wine and have a good time. I think I just went, you know, for reasons to network more than it was to watch the show. So I didn't know much about The Bachelor at all, other than I didn't feel like it was for Black people, which is exactly what I said to them when I watched it. I was like, it's a running joke. We don't watch the show. It's not for us. You decided to audition anyway. Do you submit a tape? Do you immediately go in? What is the initial process like? So it's different for everyone. Um, My process, though, was to go to an actual in-person audition, which I highly suggest to anybody who is interested in going on a reality TV show. I always say I'm better in person, but I there were girls on my season who had submitted a tape or someone else had submitted something for them. But I went to the in-person in Dallas and I just remember, I was like, okay, it's crowded, but not as crazy as I thought. I went with a friend. There were, you have to fill out like 30 pages of questions. You take a picture and then you wait in line, but they had the line separated. And the line that I was in was much shorter, but it was taking a really long time. And there were people there that were putting, telling you where to go. And come to find out the line that I was in and the girl next to me told me, she was like, oh no, you want to stay in this line? Because I was like, the other ones are moving faster. I got to get back to work. She's like, no the casting producer is in this line. I don't know how she knew, but she knew what we were going inside to see. But it was just a fun, I love to people watch. So it was just a fun experience to people watch. I was in like a, like a tank top and some flowy pants and flip flops, barely any makeup. But I saw women there dressed like they were going to prom. That's like (laughs) bringing me back to, I mean, nowadays, especially in a post COVID world or in a world where in which we have all experienced this new COVID world. Um, as an actor, you would go in to audition rooms and you would be in all the audition rating rooms. And now you just send in tapes. And I miss that like tension of the room where everyone's just looking at everyone and, <laughs> and having these like bizarre like n- conversations that are just like so trying to one up on each other, but like in these kind of like sneaky catty ways. And it was just like, that was like real life reality TV. It's just the waiting room itself. I was going to say, it's The Bachelor. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. You've written and um, spoken a lot about the experience. And were you, you've talked about when you were going through the Bachelor audition process that you said you walked into another room and it was a sea of people. Nobody was black. And in the front, there were three chairs two for the executive producers and one for me. Mm -hmm. Was there a moment where you were like, huh, this like, was there any part of you that then didn't want to continue the process or had a preemptive feeling of what the process would become, you know, like foreshadowing essentially? No, I wasn't. I was very naive when I went in that that's not my world. You know, at that point I was only practicing law. If I had gone if it was a courtroom, I would have understood it. So I was just kind of going with the flow. It was just such an interesting and new experience for me that I was like, oh, okay. You want me to go into this room? Oh, okay. These people are here. I didn't even know that they were executive producers immediately. It came through the conversation when I was being interviewed. And walking into that room and being the only Black person, that had been my life. I, at that time, I was the only Black attorney at my firm. I went to a predominantly white school growing up, even college. So I was used to, it's familiar to me, as sad as it can be, to be the only person who looks like me in a room. So that didn't throw me off. When I started answering questions and when I saw how they were talking to me, I was like, oh, they like me. I immediately knew then that they wanted me to be on the show. I didn't think Bachelorette. I didn't go that far. I was just like, oh my gosh, I have to tell my job because this is actually happening. I didn't really think I would get this far in the process. What kind of law do you practice or did you practice? Civil defense litigation. So I defended companies when they got sued. The insurance company would hire my firm. So I had like a lot of Walmart cases, um, which were always very interesting. It goes goes down at Walmart. (laughs) (laughs) 
that is what would be really interesting because you do have to put your entire life on hold. I think that that's yeah. what a lot of people who watch these shows in which, you know, you really, you are gone. Like you don't, you have to, and you're not being like paid this insane amount of money to go on a show like this. So you have to think right. about affording rent, afford, you know, even though you're not staying at your, wherever your house or your apartment is, you have to tell your job and hope that your job is willing to take you back when, you know, if, and when you do come back, um, the investment and in, in all the clothes that you will be wearing because it's television. No, you're so right. These are things you don't think about until you say yes and then it becomes a reality. So I was extremely fortunate. My boss had recently become a super fan of the show. And so he was like, oh my gosh, you're going to be the Bachelorette. And I, wa I was like, no, John, I'm not going to be the Bachelorette. I mean, I guess he could see things in my future that I couldn't. And he's like, do they need to talk to me? Do they need? And I was like, no, John, they don't need to talk to you. I just need your permission to go. And I was very blessed too, because they paid me while I was gone. Because he said, how long do you think you'd be gone? I'm like, ah, we don't go far. I'll probably make it to the second week. And I was gone 10 weeks. And I didn't have to worry about rent and bills because I was fortunate enough to where my job was still allowing me, you know, to be paid, say on salary. I didn't have to take a sabbatical or anything. And then again, they did the same thing when I was the bachelorette. I was fortunate that they saw the advantage of me being on the show and how that could help bring in clients and add a different perspective into to the firm. But a lot of people don't have that. And there's a lot of times I learned later as I would talk to producers that there would be someone they were so into, but their job wouldn't let them go. And mm -hmm. people were too scared to take that leap. That fear, I didn't have to make that decision. And I'm very grateful for it because I don't know if I would have been courageous enough to say, well, I'm just going to go out and take this risk. I don't know if I could have done that. Thank goodness John was into the show because you did go out there. Um, this was a Nick Viles season. And mm -hmm. I love that you guys have even, even though obviously you did not end up with Nick, which is also how you became the Bachelorette, obviously. Yeah. Um, you guys have been like interviewed each other. You guys are good. Like I love that after all these years, you guys have been able to sit down and have really wonderful conversations. It cemented the connection that you guys had and especially I think nowadays people watch reality TV and think like, oh, well, then and none of it was just ever real, which is not true. I think that it's gotten more difficult to create real moments now because of social mm -hmm. media and how it's kind of changed the game. Um, but I think that you were in the sweet spot of reality TV where people were really coming on for these connections. And obviously, yeah. you know, it would work out for you in a whole other way because you are married to the man that you gave the final rose to in your bachelorette season. Yeah. You are told by Nick that you're not moving on. You don't get the rose. And within 24 hours, the producers are already pitching you to be the bachelorette. Couldn't believe it. I was like, what? I mean, I was really upset that Nick didn't pick me. I get that question a lot. Were you really sad? Yes, it's rejection. I had spent nine weeks with this man. He was the only man in my entire world. <laughs> and I was shocked that we connected because you just don't know. You're like, will he like me? Will I like him? And we had an instant connection. I knew we would have a friendship, which you want to be the basis of any relationship that you have. So I was upset. I was sad. I, I knew it wasn't me. But, you know, part of me still wanted it to be me. So I'm still trying to process all of that. And then you're also trying to process going back into the real world because you haven't had your phone. You haven't watched TV. And at that time, the election had just happened. So I was like going back to a whole new country. The 2016 I, election. Yes, yeah. the 2016 election. So I was like, it's all like it comes. It's like it comes flooding. You open a door and it, everything just comes rushing in at you all at once. And then to add to that. They're like, hey, let's go talk to the EPs. And I'm like, okay, they're just checking on me because I've been sad. And they're like, what do you think about being the Bachelorette? And I was like, you got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. I remember, I don't think I put this, I don't remember if I put this book or not. We were in the final four and I just left my hometowns. And I remember they were like, your mom wants to call. There's an issue with your dog. And so when you talk to a family member, you have to be on speakerphone. So they put my mom on speakerphone. And so she's talking to me and a handler's there. And she's like, we got to figure out what to do with copper, blah, 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 blah. So I'm talking to her. And then she goes, listen, 
You need to figure out what you're going to do because the blogs are saying you're the next bachelorette and we need to figure out. And the handler was like, no, 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 stop. That's enough. You can't say that. And so that was the first time. So we're final four at this point. That was the first time that it had even crossed my mind because you're really thinking about the relationship in that bubble. So I was like, what? Why are people doing that? I'm still on this journey with Nick. Does Nick think I want to be the bachelorette? Like I got upset. I was like, does he think that I'm just here, you know, for it to be the next lead? Is he distracted by this? Is this what everyone's talking about? So it really messed with my mind and I didn't want it. I wanted to see that relationship through and then I wanted to process the breakup, but then they started talking to me about Bachelorette, which is why I was just like, no, I don't know. This is for me. And then they said, go home and think about it. And I did for a month. And during that month, um, you you were in church. You've spoken about how you went to a church (laughs) service and someone came up to you and said that their daughter likes the show and that they were so excited that their daughter could see someone who represents her and if the rumors are right, uh, that you will go far in The Bachelor and that hopefully you would be The Bachelorette. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that was part of what made you think, hmm, maybe this is bigger than just me being The Bachelorette. Because you would have been, you were the first Black Bachelorette. Right. Based off of your experience during Nick's season, was there any apprehension as to how that would be handled? Did that play a part into your decision making as becoming the first black bachelorette for ABC based off of how the production handled your experience on Nick's season? Yeah, it's, it's, um, so different because you really, when you're a contestant, it's, and now I know, since I've been on both sides, it's Mm -hmm. totally different experience than being the lead. And my experience during the bachelor was great. I had so much fun. I made beautiful friendships. I learned a lot about myself. I learned what I wanted out of a relationship. And partly that came through production and the conversations that we would have and the way that they would push me on certain issues to think about things in a way that I hadn't before that I really could do with a clear head because I had no outside distractions. So my experience with production was fine because as a contestant, it's just so different than how you have to deal with production as the lead, because as the lead, you are the show. That didn't influence my decision to, if anything, it did in a positive way, influence my decision to say on, yes on The Bachelorette. What was hard for me, what I had to get over was what this would mean for me after The Bachelorette. How would this affect my legal career? Mm. Would I have a job after this? you know, I did well on The Bachelor. Will I do well on The Bachelorette? Will people like me? Will they judge me more harshly because I am a first and they haven't seen someone who looks like me in this role? Will I find love? Will I be played? I mean, it's just so many different things. Can I turn people down? Like that's, that's something that I underestimated was one of the hardest parts was getting people to open up to you, knowing that you're going to send them home. That's something that I never got over. And at one point in my season, I just completely broke down because I was going to have to break someone's heart. Those were more of my, the issues that I dealt with about saying yes, but not necessarily with production because I really had a good experience with them as a contestant. Looking back, what was the experience you had with them when you were the bachelorette then? Yeah, as the bachelorette, I felt misunderstood. Because it was my season, although I I loved my producer that I had so, so much. At the end of the day, there were certain things as her being a white woman and me being a black woman and me trying to explain like social issues or the way I'm navigating certain relationships that just weren't the same or the way that I would be judged by black America, but then also be judged by America, the way that people would question certain things that I did. And I also wanted to make sure that I was representing myself as a black woman. There was no body on my side that I could bounce those ideas off with. There was nobody who could understand me in that way. And that was very difficult. When I tried to explain certain situations of, oh, I think this guy doesn't date black women. And they would say, well, how do you know that? And I said, it's just something within the community, specifically as Black women, that we know. And they were like, that is so fascinating. That is so, and and they said that, because those guys actually had a conversation about that and you were right. That's so fascinating that you knew that. 
And they said, well, you should take this person on a date to explore that because it's so interesting that he's black and has never dated a black woman. And for me, that was very triggering to be not liked by someone. You know, I I have an issue if I, I could, obviously I'm in an interracial relationship, so I have no problem with that. But I have an issue when you refuse to date people who look like you. And that is deeply rooted in just this whole, the value of a black woman. And I was trying to explain that, but nobody understood me because it was just a new storyline concept for them that they had never explored, not realizing how hurtful that was to me. So there were just certain things that I just felt so misunderstood by because one, they couldn't because they hadn't walked in my shoes, but also there was no desire to. The desire was to produce a good show in their eyes. Well, I'd ima- imagine the frustration, too, of them trying to, th- they're still in charge of the narrative, but then expecting you to hold their hand through a narrative oh that my they don't gosh. understand. You- Nail on the head. I used to say that, too. Like, I had to teach them about the Black experience as well. Also, while trying to navigate this whole new experience for myself and figure out if I was falling in love. I had I had to be the teacher and the student in, in some ways. And that's something that no other lead had to do. They would ask me certain questions about, they would sometimes being Black and some of the what the Black contestants were going through, but it was just a lot. And I didn't anticipate that. I just assumed they'll have somebody, they'll bring in some producers for me. They brought in producers for um, the guy in the yeah. house, but they didn't for me. When did you know you were falling in love? Because this, that, that, oh, it, I can't imagine all, everything that you just ex- explained. The emotional um, roller coaster it seems to feel, feels like I'm putting it lightly, but just the emotional weight that you, you, like you're having to wrestle with there, on top of the isolation, the yeah. complete isolation. And then when did you? When did the light shine in? When you start going, oh my gosh, I'm actually falling in love with someone here. Yeah, it's. I remember. When, they, when everyone came out the limo, I was like, this is it? I was like, and I, I didn't, it didn't even feel like I had met 31 men. I was like, this is it? I'm disappointed. Like as a whole, I thought it would be different than this. And um, they were like, my producer said, why don't you just go in there and have conversations? And I'm so glad that she did that because she was right. And when, after that first night I had those conversations, I was like, okay, there are several guys in here that I think could, you know, something could be there if, if, if it is what I think it is. And, you know, if you watch my season, you know that like I had a top two and I went back and forth and I remember I would go on a date and I'd be like, oh my gosh, he's the one. And then I would go on another date and I'd be like, no, he's the one. And then I would go on a date with someone else. And I was like, no, it's him. <laughs> and so it's so, you just fall in love almost on every single date, to be honest with you. So you're constantly questioning, questioning what's real and what's not and who makes sense in real life and who doesn't. Well, but and it's the I most remember, ridiculous dates. Like these are not just like I pizza know. and a movie. It's like, where? We're going to be helicoptered onto the top of a mountain and have a cold bottle of Chardonnay and, and have goats come and bring us flowers. <laughs> you're like, what? It is, you're so right. And it is so easy to fall <laughs> in love. And it is so hard to keep things into perspective. Um, but I would say that hometowns were very telling for me, spending that time with all four of my, the top four. And with seeing how they interact with their family and getting clarity on certain things from family members. And I remember Brian, I remember, well, when I went on Brian's date, um, which is funny because it was in Miami and now I'm like, we lived in Miami. So to go to some of those places in real life has just always been interesting. But um, I remember I told his producer, Brian's the one, it's him. And I was like, tipsy. And she goes, wait, what? And I go, no, I'm just tipsy. I'm just kidding. I don't, don't. but I remember I truly felt it in that moment, but I still had love and like really cared for my other three guys too. So that gets like really murky and cloudy. But I remember I said that to her. And then later that night, Brian told me that he loved me. And I I, I was like, oh, I want to say it back. And I said it back in Spanish. And then my producer goes, we heard what you said. What is, what is te amo mean? And I said, oh, like I played dumb. I was like, doesn't it mean like I like you? I was like, my Spanish isn't that good. And it's not. But I was like, it means I like you. And He's like, uh, yeah, you're cool. I'll hang out with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it just means I like you. So that really was the moment. And then it just got better. Like then that moment, Fantasy Suites, 
the final date, I was like, it's definitely Brian, even it was though it was so hard to say goodbye to other people. And you guys just celebrated your third wedding anniversary? Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. Congratulations. Thank you. And what a wild way to like that that whenever anyone for anyone that's been living under a rock for all these years that will be like, How did you guys meet? Like, have you had anyone ask ask you guys? I'm sure you oh, have all but... the time. Just just naturally. People, yeah. you know, they don't watch the show. And it's it's almost weird to say now. We're like, um, we both just kind of look at each other and we're like, <laughs> Um, t- we'll say TV and they're like, oh, do you both work in TV? And we're like, no, we met on a reality TV show. We get nervous saying yeah. it. I don't know why, like we're going to be judged or something. Well, it's funny. It's also when there's a level of notoriety, people always kind of like skirt around it. Or when you know there's going to be a million follow-up questions. Like I'll, yeah. I've done that when I just don't feel like someone's like, oh, what do you do? I'll normally I'll say an actor and it goes pretty quickly. But sometimes if I don't feel like talking about it, but I was in an airport bar talking with someone next to me and we, it was a layover. And he's like, so what do you do? And I was like, oh, you know, TV. And I was like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, you know, like I work. And but within like a drink, I was like, yeah, I'm an actress. I worked on this show. And he's like, I work for the FBI. I was like, oh, shit, this is fair. Like, <laughs> you are done for. No, I've got a fun. million questions for you. <laughs> you met your match for yes. sure. <laughs> but he was like, I never really like to tell anyone because then I have to like continue the conversation. <laughs> I'm yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I get that. I get that. <laughs> um, well, I I love also, I mean, that must be something that is very difficult coming off of such a well-known franchise, you know, like Bachelor Nation, um, to figure out what next. Did you come home and go, I want to continue law? Did you kind of have this, you know, were you wrestling with like, what do you want your career to look like moving forward? Um, what was it like to come home and realize, oh, now I have to do life? Yeah. Between Bachelor and Bachelorette, I went back to practicing and I was in a trial and it was a really interesting trial. So, I mean, I was doing trial until I left to go um, announce on Jimmy Kimmel. So I was announced as the Bachelorette. I flew to GMA and I came back to wait for the jury's verdict. Like it was, I was right in the thick of things. So that kept me really grounded and that was nice. And then, but then coming off of Bachelorette and then making history in that way is, was like a whole nother level to it that I wasn't necessarily uh, prepared for. But I just immediately went back to what I knew. I remember when the show was over, Brian and I were like, look, people weren't happy with us after the show. We had a lot of backlash and it just seemed to be all encompassing. So we were like, let's just go back to what we know. He had already agreed to move to Dallas. We went to Dallas. We went to Miami, moved him, came back to Dallas, and then just surrounded ourselves with people who knew us. And he got licensed in Texas. And then I went back to practicing law because that's what kept us us and not getting caught up in all the opinions or just the fame and notoriety surrounding it all. And so I was, I was in the courtroom. I had a couple of people who would say like, oh my gosh, she was on The Bachelorette. But other than that, people let me do my thing. And then yeah. on the weekends and when I had free time, I was freelancing for free as um, a TV personality because I knew I wanted to get into this business. When did you get that bug? Have you always had it? I always wanted to work in sports. My major is sports management and I went and focused on sports law and law school and I thought I would be an agent. And then I said, no, I think I just want to work behind the scenes in sports. But I didn't know quite what that looked like. So um, I decided to I, that I wanted to do this when I was doing interviews. When I started doing interviews and rounds and like doing media training for The Bachelorette, I was like, oh, I like this side of the camera. I really enjoy conversation and talking with people and connecting in that way. And you know how you take those life plan test or career plans or whatever they may be like back in high school and college, mine always said communication. And so I felt very much like myself, even though I was the interviewee and I was like, I want to sit, I want to do that. I want to sit on that side of it. And so a couple of opportunities came my way and I was able to figure out what I did like and what I didn't like, because that definitely changed. But I knew that I wanted to be on camera connecting with people. Most people would be listening, assuming that the world was your oyster. 
that you could have been like, oh, you know what? I want to be this correspondent right now. And I can do that because I was the I was the bachelorette. But I I know that that's not always how it works. <laughs> People just assume that once you've you know reached a certain amount of notoriety in one thing that you can just demand when the next job is. So exactly. you have to really prove yourself. It's hard that like breaking into like any sort of journalist, like interviewing any kind on that side of the camera, it's really hard and competitive. Yeah. So when did you know, like, okay, no, I'm, I'm on the right track. I'm going to get closer. This is definitely what I want to do. I mean, I knew I was on the right track. Like I, when I came off, I was definitely, like you said, I was feeling myself because of, you know, coming, being the first black bachelorette. And I was just like, oh, this is, you know, people want me and ESPN called. And I was like, this is it. I made it. And then they ended up telling me no, but it was the best no I could get. I was not ready for that. And I would have bombed and it would have been embarrassing. At that moment, when I got the no, I was devastated. But at the same time, I was like, I'm going to show them that I deserve to be here because I want it. And I love that I now have a story to tell about it rather than, oh, it just came easy for me because I was the bachelorette. So naturally, ABC, ESPN put me on. No, I was grinding. I was flying myself out for free. I was taking any type of job that I could get. I was, you know, working hard to kind of like figure out my voice, but then also figure out the path that I wanted to. I was networking. I was meeting people. And when I saw how hard I was working at that, plus still practicing law, because I didn't stop until the end of 2018. That's when I was like, no, this is what I want to do. This is really where I want to be. And I'm I'm really glad at the way that it that it turned out. What was the first interview where you were like, yeah, I'm here? It wasn't an interview. It was getting to moderate first take. It was getting to be on a show that I watched every day that I people reminded me when they saw me finally get to moderate, they reminded me and said, Rachel, you always said that you were going to do that. And I was like, I did? And they're like, yes. <laughs> so it was that moment. I, rem I will never forget them counting down, going live, and me saying, hi, I'm Rachel Lindsay. This is first take. It's like that moment. I was like, if I never get another job after this, <laughs> I will at least can say that I made it doing this. Yes. <laughs> Are you a manifester? Do you write things down? Absolutely. Do you vision board? Absolutely. Um, yes. I, I don't vision board. Every year I buy the board. It's literally sitting behind <laughs> me right now. I buy the board. I buy the magazines. and But I never sit down and do it, which is so embarrassing. But I'm absolutely a manifester and I believe in meditation. I talk to myself all the time. I'm wearing a bracelet right now. This says strong AF. It's a little words bracelet because that's the message that I needed today with going through certain things. So I am, I truly believe in it. Um, I'll just tell you a really quick story. I, I'm a notes taker in my app and I, when things weren't necessarily coming for me, I was, you know, Free, I knew I, what I wanted to do, but it wasn't happening. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to create this myself. I wrote down every time, like TV, radio, film, podcasting. And I put names of people that I wanted to work with and that I admired. And one of the names that I wrote was Bill Simmons. And fast forward, I now have a podcast, two podcasts under the Ringer Network with Spotify through Bill Simmons, somebody I can just like call up in my phone, somebody whose career I've admired so much. And so those moments of, you know, being able to call like Bill a mentor, sitting next to Stephen A. Smith, who could gives me advice and I call a friend, people I've looked up to and admired. It's like, okay, all right, this is it. <laughs> this is it. And so that manifesting those moments you know, I, that's why I like truly believe and tell people, believe it, say it, speak it, put it out there. Well, and it's the long game. It's not just like the short, like, oh, well, I just want to do something right this second because it, it's like the long game of setting a goal. And when you actually see it come into fruition, not even knowing how you're going to get there, not seeing the clear path, but knowing that it's those little tiny steps that you're taking every day to hopefully get a little bit closer. And I think mm -hmm. in this time when we have like such immediacy with social media and it's so easy to see everyone's highlight reel, it's really easy 
to forget that it's hard. It doesn't just happen sure. overnight to get to like the things that have foundation, things that will root ourselves even deeper within our own lives. Um, and so I feel like that's something it's nice to hear that because it's so easily forgotten. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Rachel, Lindsay, I am so excited that we finally got to meet. Um, we have mutual friends. Um, I'm even more excited to not only hear your love story. Congratulations again, you and Brian, but also we can read. It's not your exact love story, but you wrote your first novel, um, Real Love. Uh, mm -hmm. Congratulations. And if just like a couple sentences on what readers can expect when they read Real Love. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, Real Love was an idea that I had at the same time that I was writing my own memoir, my book of essays, because I always go back to that moment of what if I had never said yes to any of this? I mean, sometimes this doesn't even feel real. I pinch myself and I'm like, going to wake up and, you know, you're going to be my cashier at the supermarket or, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, it was all this a figment of my imagination. And I think about how close I was to almost saying no. And so I wanted to explore that. I wanted to go back to the girl who was in a dead end relationship, but just holding it out because she was too afraid to leave. Who was too afraid to leave the job that she was in because this is what she said she was always going to do. And I wanted, it was almost therapeutic for me to explore that in a fictional way. And I think a lot of times we all do that. What if I had done this? What if I had said yes? What if I had said no? What if I had gone right instead of left? And because it's so relatable, I felt like this is something fun to explore. And there's so many ways you can go with it. And it was just this beautiful way to escape and get caught up in this fictional world of real love. So I think a lot of people will enjoy it because it's not just a romance novel. It's really women's fiction. And there's a love story, but then there's another love story within it. And so I'm really proud of it. And um, I hope everyone enjoys it or is enjoying it who's reading it now. Well, thank you so much. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you. This has been a Super Boom podcast hosted by me, Candace King, produced by Melissa D. Mons and Diamond Imprint Productions. Post-production sound by Chris Henry and advertisement partnerships with Acast.